the time of the Buddha, people began going to him, asking for him to be their teacher. In the beginning, there were no rules. It was quite understood that when one left home, one basically left everything they had. So the Buddha did not have to enumerate upon this. In other words, with those first disciples, he did not tell them, you can't have a girlfriend. Because the ascetics have given up the place, those pleasures. And he did not have to tell them that they did, did not need to have money. Because there was nothing for an ascetic to buy. Typically ascetics in India at that time and even today will wander off into the forest. And the only clothes they have are the clothes on their back. Which means after a while they become very, very dirty. And after a longer time they begin to rot until we get to the condition of a senior ascetic who is usually pretty close to naked. He didn't have to talk about possessions with them. And it was basically understood that an ascetic did not eat a lot of food. That they ate just what was necessary to exist. But as time went by, he had a number of people from the villages who would come to him and ask to be his disciple. And we know from the sutras that on many occasions they were wealthy. Often they were cousins of the Buddha or they were royalty. And so he had to start formulating the rules. The typical ceremony at the time was someone come to the Buddha and they say, Master, I want to be your disciple. And the Buddha would look at him and try to look into his heart and then he would tell one of his disciples he already had, now you take so-and-so and you get some robes for him. And you take off his, his civilian clothes and you teach him how to put on the robes. And that really was pretty much the first lesson they had. Robes were very simple then. Now at this temple we actually have quite a few robes. Mung has all the robes he needs. Fu Men has all the robes he needs. As far as I know, he hasn't asked for another robe. I certainly have more robes than I can ever wear out because they've been given as a gift. But in those times, the Sangha gave the new novice a gift. Now these robes were not like the clothes we wear. If you look at India today, and you look at the ladies in India today, Many of, them, many of them have beautiful saris, and they're a big square of cloth. 
and they have a particular way they wrap it around their body and secure it and wear it. That was the customary dress of the time. So that they could take anybody of any size and give them a robe to wrap around their body. And they had different, different articles of robe. One of the things they had was uh, like a skirt uh, to keep them from uh, exposing themselves. And my good friend and brother Suhita Dharma was ordained in all three traditions. And when he passed away, his uh, some of his robes were sent to me, which I in turn gave to the monks who were at this temple at that time. And one of the things he had was his Theravada robes. Because if he went to a big celebration and there were a lot of Theravada monks there, he would dress as a Theravada monk. And he had taken this one piece of cloth which would be wrapped around the waist and tucked. Uh, and someone, him or someone else, had sewed it together like a skirt and put elastic in the waist. So that all he had to do was just pull it up like a pair of pants. And uh, then he was not exposed. And there were other articles all the monks had one of these square, they're all squares of cloth, or rectangles of cloth, that they could use as a towel when they went into the river to wash. And I was pleasantly surprised many years ago to find out they had a handkerchief so they could roll their nose. And so they had all of these different articles that were necessary. They had a ground cloth, and the ground cloth was so they could, another rectangle, so they could sit on the bare ground without getting dirty. We have a variation on that in that we use these rectangular cushions to give us a little cushion against the hard floor. But the monks would just simply sit on the ground with his ground cloth. And for the most part, the Theravada monks of the Theravada countries, which are Cambodia and Laos and Thailand and Sri Lanka, and they dress pretty much the same. One thing that they tend to do, I really don't know if they do it in the Orient or in Asia, uh, but when they come here, they tend to wear some sort of shirt uh, on the top half of their body because otherwise they're, they're always are partially exposed. And so some of them will wear a, a yellow or an orange t-shirt some of them will simply have a shirt shirt. And life was pretty simple. Except, almost from the beginning, we had nobility that would go to the Buddha and say, Master, I want to follow you. Now, I, I kind of think of the royal family in England. You know, there are certain things they do and certain things they don't. And some of you may be aware of those. I always admired the Queen of England because of her reserve and the fact that she did not abuse her power. That she truly lived for the good of her country. 
But these guys would come, and they were what we t we. If you think about it, we have a notion in this country, in this democracy, of wealthy people who are pretty much spoiled. And if you don't know what I mean, how 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 expensive a car do you need to drive? How big a house do you need to live in? How much money do you actually need in the bank? And there are people that have more than they could ever exhaust. We have a lady that comes here. She's a very nice lady. Lots of experience. She was born in England. And she ended up, uh, before her life was over, she's still with us. She got a PhD in botany, which is no small accomplishment, particularly in England for women. But sometimes she complains about her finances. And she's actually older than me, if you can believe that. And uh, I tell her, you're, you're fine. You have what you need. Sometimes I even tell her she's wealthy. She told me the other day, because uh, when she would start complaining about not having enough money or how much something cost, I would say, you're rich. I don't stop complaining. And she came in to me and she bent down after the service when we usually have a cup of tea. And she said, you know, you said I was wealthy. And she told me her daughter had flown her to New York. Now, if you don't know, this, uh, this little episode in the life of Zen in the high desert of California is coming from California. wondering why I'm sounding so weird and breathing, so I had to go back to the hospital for quite a while, and it's still taking me a very long time to recover from the last hospital visit. Six weeks now? Yeah, yeah six weeks. So if I found exhausted and this and that, that's because basically I am. And I, I haven't been at services for the last five weeks, four weeks, uh, because I can't go very far and I run out of oxygen. But we had a fundraiser yesterday, which I could not go to. It involved six hours of driving and three hours of sitting. And <laughs> As you can see, I probably wouldn't have done very well if I went. We'd have had to call one of those special vehicles with a light on the roof to take me home. Whew. So these guys didn't quite understand what was going on. They truly felt that Siddhartha Gautama was a holy man. But they didn't really understand what he had gone through. They just knew that he was a holy man. In India, they believed in holy men. So the Buddha had to start telling them how to act. Very much like a child. And out of this grew the, the idea of having a novice. Because to ordain someone in the Sangha, and they, have, they don't have a book of rules. Uh, they could easily break the rules because they have to memorize them. So the Buddha early on decided that these brand new monks need to be put with an older monk. 
and at the time it was uh, it was not a lot. You might put uh, these brand new monks, brand new shaven heads, with uh, an older monk to be his master, and you might that master might have two or three monks. And he was given the task of teaching that novice to teach the teachings of the Buddha, what the Buddha taught. And so, slowly over time, it got codified. And most Buddhists know most of the important rules. One rule is no girlfriend. Another rule, I know it seems obvious, but you cannot kill. Certainly cannot kill a human being. If you have a girlfriend or you have you kill, you have to leave the Sangha. You can't stay. No theft. From the very beginning, these monks did not really own anything. They were allowed to carry a few things. Besides their clothes, they might have a small bag or box, and they would carry a needle and thread. They could carry some medicine for when they got sick. Not very much. So, cannot accumulate wealth, cannot take what doesn't belong to you. A scholar some 30 years ago looked at this problem, probably got a PhD for doing it. How much could a monk have before he was in trouble? Well, monks could have a few cents. But he determined about a quarter. If they stole a quarter, they had to leave the Sangha. If they stole the dime, they had to admit it and say, I have committed theft. And he would have to do this with the senior monks and the Sangha. And we have what we call grave offenses. And those ones I've mentioned are the grave offenses because you can be asked to leave forever. Now, there's a funny kind of tradition that's grown up in the Theravada. And that is that you can stop being a monk for a while and come back. And I never ever can remember whether it's five or six times. And every time I mention this, I say that, and I wait for one of my students to go, oh, it's six times. Oh, no, it's five times. But it's a, it's a couple of times. We have this very unique condition. I don't know that it exists any place but in, in Thailand that every male, every man, some one time in his life wants to be a monk. Now, they could be a monk for two weeks. And I asked a good friend of mine who was a Theravada monk, I said, uh, isn't this confusing for people? That uh, they have this monk, and he's a monk for a couple, three weeks, but he's wearing the robes, and he has his head shaved, and blah, blah. And he told me, he said, no, in, in Thailand, uh, everybody knows who these are, and they, they have a special name for them. I don't know what it is. But uh, temporary monks would be the translation. That they're temporary monks, they're doing this just for the holiness of doing it. They have not taken uh, lifetime vows. So that's kind of interesting. And if you've ever seen the movie or the play The King and the I, King and I, 
I don't even know if I'm pronouncing my words well enough for everybody can understand me. Ben McKing and I, which I loved that movie, Yul Brenner was very famous for it. The, the king of, of Siam, which is Thailand, would go and become a, a child monk for a while and learn about Buddhism because it, Thailand is, uh, has a state religion, which is Buddhism. So, for a monk, there are very grave rules that have to be followed. Then there are very serious rules that have to be followed. And there are very light rules that have to be followed. And I'll give you an example of each one. The grave rule I've already talked about. The most grave rule is to take a life, a human life. A serious rule, which is my favorite one, and I always, always mention it, is to go behind the bush with a girl. And in that is a great lesson. My master, Thich Tianan, that was one of the first lessons I learned from him. And, you know, Americans, we're such a special breed. You know, we, we believe everybody is entitled to their opinions. We believe that so strongly that we take our royalty and we re-elect them every five years. Four years? Four. Four years. I'm really with it today, aren't I? Yeah. And we've got that going on now. We've got two people that want to be president. And things will change when whichever one becomes president, things will change. But we're strong believers. People are allowed to have their own opinions. It's so strong we put a document out that says everyone has freedom of speech. It doesn't say they have freedom of belief, but by the time they get done with it, that's what it means. People like to point out that America was founded on Christian ideas. And recently, one state decided that all schools will have the Ten Commandments in them. But you know, you get to not believe here. If you're an atheist, that's okay. If you're an agnostic, that's okay. If you belong to some weird religion that somebody made up, that's okay. That's your belief. We allow people to have their own beliefs. Well, what is this business about going behind the bush? The Buddha said, and this already happened. Almost every one of the rules, we have a story that goes behind it to explain why there's a rule. In other words, nobody knew there was a rule because nobody had ever broken it. And then the Buddha said, oops, I better tell you, you can't do that. And this is because someone came to the Buddha and said, hey, Bob, just went behind that bush with that really pretty girl. Now, just because you're celibate, which is what happens with monks, they don't have girlfriends, it doesn't mean that you don't realize that girls are pretty, or women are pretty, and uh, that you don't appreciate it, it means you can't do anything about it. And he said, Bob went behind the bush. So the Buddha said, Bob, come on over here. What were you doing behind the bush with that girl? He said, oh, Lord, she asked me about what she taught. She was very, very shy. 
and she wanted to know about the Four Noble Truths, the basic teaching you have. And the Buddha said, why did you go behind the bush? And Bob said, well, she's shy. And uh, she didn't want to know people. People would know that she actually had to ask questions. And the Buddha said, don't do that. And he got everybody together. And the Sangha, which is all the collection of monks, and later monks and nuns, have lunch together. They only have one meal a day. And the Buddha said, I've got a little announcement to make. Do not do anything that can be misinterpreted. Now, Bob over here went behind the bush with the girl. You all know the girl. She's very, very pretty. And I told him, don't do that. If you need to talk to that girl, do it in the open. Because people, will, their imaginations will start going. And they will start thinking that you're, something, you're do, doing something with that girl. A little time went by. Bob's talking to that girl again. Gosh, she's a good looking gal. And he's standing on this side of the bush. But nobody can tell what he's saying. They see, they see his lips moving. And they see the girl, she's nodding and she's going, yes. Mm -hmm. The says, okay, these kids are going to drive me crazy. And at lunchtime, he said, all right, come on, guys. we got to have a new rule now. And you can thank Bob. Well, what did Bob do? Well, Bob, you know that pretty girl? Yes. Well, she came to Bob and he said, we've got to stand on the other side of the bush. But nobody could tell what he was saying. Because he was talking in a very low voice. And he could have been arranging to see her at night when nobody could see what was going on. So from now on, if you're going to talk to a girl, you have to have another monk with you. You have to have a chaperone. Therefore, you won't do, make any mistakes. And so we got a new rule. If you're going to, if a boy, if a, a monk is going to talk to a woman, he has to have a second monk with him. Those are, those are the serious rules. Then we get into what I call manners. And Emily Post, remember she wrote a book? I had one in my library, I just got rid of it. I figured nobody looks at it anymore about what good manners is. And You gotta remember some of these some of these were really kids, I mean kid kids, very young teenagers. So the Buddha said, okay, we're all having lunch together and everybody notices Bob, by the way. Bob's always getting in trouble. Someone came to me and complained that Bob is always looking in his bowl. Now, one of the articles that a monk had was a begging bowl. And they come in all shapes and sizes today. In, in some Theravada countries, they're as big as this bell. In the Mahayana, they're not so big. And there's rules that follow with these. Now, the Buddha had already told them all right, look, when you go, to, go into the village and you bake for lunch in the morning, don't tell them what you want. That's, that, by the way, that's a major rule. Do not tell them what you want. Just put your bowl out and recite what I taught you. You can recite the Four Noble Truths over and over again if you want to. But don't look at them. Why not? Don't make them feel guilty if they don't have really good food to give you. 
if you go to the door and you stand there and you chant three times and they don't give you anything, move on. Don't stand there and harass these people to give you whatever they got. Now, what monks were getting was what was left over from the meal the day before. And he said, when we get back here, don't look in, the, in each other's bowls. You know? Bob is always looking to see who has steak. Because at that time, there were some monks that tried to be vegetarian. Bob wasn't one of them. He'd look at the bowls, oh, look at that, oh, what a delicious looking piece of beef. And the boy said, don't do that. Eat whatever's in your bowl. Now that's one rule that has changed, by the way. But that's a minor rule anyway, is that now most there are a lot of places to go collect the food and they bring it all to the kitchen and they put it on the table. And they put meat here, and they put vegetables here, and they put rice here, and they put fruit here, and the monks just go and take whatever they want. They only get to go one time. And the Buddha said a very important rule is once we had a full sangha where we had women in it. The sangha had, the Buddha had to say to the younger disciples, you are not to spit cherry pits at the nuns. Apparently that was a favorite activity of the young monks. And those are good manner rules. And there's a bit of a formula. If the more serious the offense, the more, the older the monk you have to go and confess it to. Sometimes you can con confess it to your teacher. Sometimes you're required to have five monks there. Sometimes you're required to have everybody there. Sometimes you're not required to have anybody there. Like if you're checking out bowls, you might just say to yourself, I just broke that precept. I'll try not to do it again. Kind of like somebody trying to quit smoking, you know. Well, I got this pack of cigarettes. Somehow, magically, one disappeared. I know what happened to it. I'll try to do better next time. So, because of these rules, there's 250 of them in one, one uh, group of monks. There's 227 in another group of monks. There's 248 in another group. Who's going to remember? So twice a month everybody gets together. And we pick the oldest monk who has memorized all the rules. Nothing was written down in the Buddhist time. And we had monks that memorized all the rules, so we might pick four men, and he starts, re starts reading the rules from his mind. Thus I have heard. And if he goofs up, Tom Men, who has a very good memory, will say, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not quite like that. This is what the Buddha said. And so at every one of these ceremonies, which take place at the new moon and the full moon, there is an old monk who recites the rules, and there is another old monk who makes sure he does it correctly. And that is our tradition. And reaffirming the precepts today is a variant on that tradition. For you, the most important rules are the five. They are cardinal rules, not to take life, not to take what doesn't belong to you, no inappropriate sexual activity, 
don't drink alcoholic beverages. I always miss one. Long speech. Harsh, harsh speech. Harsh speech. Don't say that which may harm others. And those are those are the part of the rules for the lay people. But do the best you can. But the Buddha understood everybody was human. And so twice a month they would recite these rules. And the lay people would be with them and they would recite those five. And then they would go away and they would recite all the rest of the rules. So thank you.